Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this panel discussion on digital confidence. My name is Jamie Bartlett, and I'm very happy to be here chairing this event today. I'm the director of the Center for the Analysis of Social Media at the think tank Demos. I've been working on issues related to digital confidence and the effect that digital transformations are having on social and political life for some time now. Now, before introducing our speakers, um, and I'll ask each of them to give three to four minutes each, I'd like to very briefly set out the scene as I see it. Now, I'm 33 years old. I'm a, I'm a late generation Xer. And it struck me that one day, my cohorts are going to be the last, the last group of people that remember life before the internet. A very small, narrow window of time it was, but I remember it well. And maybe one day when I'm discussing, telling my grandchildren how life was, and I'm sure they'll be asking me about it, I think these years, the 2010s, are going to be extremely important and will warrant special attention. And this is why. The early 90s may have been the time when Usenet really went mainstream, when the internet went mainstream with AOL and other private providers. But I think the last five years or so has been the era in which the power of big data, especially the power of big data to solve social problems, to be a commercial benefit for companies, for consumers, has really begun to take hold. And as more and more of us rely increasingly on various types of digital services, on internet-enabled devices, and of course that is going to continue into the future, and we are finding more and more ways of collecting and using that data, whether it's governments or companies, or indeed my think tank, my research think tank that uses public open data and personal data for research work, we increasingly understand the value that it can have for all of us. And yet as we share more, and yet as more is made public, I think we're also worrying more. I think we're worrying more about the possible misuses of that data. I think, and I think all the surveys show this, that increasingly citizens are concerned about what's happening with these digital breadcrumbs that we're leaving behind us, these traces as we surf the web and live our lives online. And indeed for governments too, who wish to use this information and aren't quite sure of the boundaries and the laws that have been passed in an essentially offline world, how they equate to an online one. Much of this is exactly that. It's a, it's a, it's a skirmish, it's difficult, and it's taking place in a society where our laws, our institutions, our education system, our culture has developed in an offline world. And this is why I think the idea, the sort of emerging idea of digital confidence is so important, which is, it seems to me that for us to thrive and survive as citizens, as consumers, as businesses, as governments, as any organizations, we need to be able to confidently and competently use, understand, be aware of how we interact with the digital world. So how do we walk that line? In many ways, actually, it's an inherently political question. How do we balance out individual goods with society ones? And I put it to you that by this time, my grandchildren have long lost interest in what I'm saying, because by then, so the doomsayers would tell you, they'll have the attention span of a goldfish or whatever. But for us who are dealing with it, I put it to you that it's an incredibly important challenge how we balance these goods. And I'm very grateful that we have such an illustrious and actually very different and varied panel to discuss these challenges. So what I'm going to ask each of them to do in three minutes each, and we're going to be seated, is how they see this unfolding, how they think what they perceive digital confidence to be and how they would navigate these challenges. And I'm going to ask them to be short and sharp set out their case in those three minutes. If you overrun, I will be cutting you off because I'm going to apply a bit of social pressure because 
The more time you speak, the less time we have for our audience questions at the end, and you wouldn't want to deprive them of that. I want to make sure that there's at least 10 minutes or 15 minutes for you all to get involved. So I'm going to sit down now. I have a privileged chair right there in the middle. Thank you, Sandy. And the running order is going to follow the seating order. So we are going to start off on our far right with Ronan Dunn, who I'm sure many of you know is the CEO of Telefonica, and I think has been actually extremely forward-thinking in how he's engaged with the issue of, of digital transformations and digital confidence. Ronan, three minutes. Jamie, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I think for us to have a digitally confident society, we need uh, a number of critical things. We need proper digital infrastructure, and right across Europe, we're getting on at rolling out 4G networks, super fast broadband, so we're starting to do that. At Campus Party this week, we're talking in many respects about the next element, which is digital literacy, an engaged community of people who understand the possibilities of technology and help to bring it to life. And the third thing we need to do is we need to deliver real digital transparency to build a confidence within society for people to engage. So the reality is the digital environment is, is, is arguably already with us. Now the journey uh, needs to be to engage customers in a way that they want to follow on and actually exploit the opportunity that a digital and data-based economy uh, can deliver. And it's important that we develop that on the basis of mutual benefit that people understand what's in it for them. The reality is more and more data is being shared and is being used legitimately by businesses. At Telephonic ourselves, our world has moved from an analog world to a truly uh, digital world. It's no longer about making calls and sending texts. And we're pioneering new services and trying to create new markets which are centered around data and more and more around mobile data. So we're looking for a contribution to what should this new model be that makes us a digitally confident society. And the key challenge is to get that regime right, one that respects citizens' rights to privacy while enabling the innovation that will lead to the creation of the next wave of internet applications for the 4G networks and beyond. So we've done some research in the UK, and very briefly, the insight that we've gleaned from that is that for customers and consumers generally to be engaged, we need to deliver on three things. We need to have informed choice, real informed choice. We need to give people meaningful options, and we need to demonstrate that there is a mutual benefit. So those three elements have to be part of that. And building on that is transparency. It's an essential element to build trust so that people want to engage in a digitally confident society. Thank you very much indeed. Let's go straight actually to uh, Nigel Shadbolt, who is the chairman and co-founder of the Open Data Institute, which I'm sure many of you have heard of, and also a professor of artificial intelligence at the University of Southampton. Thanks very much. So the way to build digital confidence, in my view, there's a very, very fundamental requirement. We need to change the fundamental asymmetry that currently exists, the asymmetry of information between citizens and the state, business and consumers. We need a new deal. Confidence comes from trust and empowerment. And that means giving consumers and citizens access to the data that governments and businesses hold about them. This is why I'm so passionate about the My Data program in the UK and the work that's going on uh, in the My Data Innovation Lab to look at the kinds of services that can be built to provide a better experience for individuals, as well as deriving and developing new economic opportunities for the businesses. So let's get that asymmetry organized there. And the other area that's fundamental is the large amounts of data that the state holds about ourselves from pensions, education, health. Let's start getting that back into the hands of individual citizens. And the other piece of this is what we see the benefits are around open data. And this is data that is free to reuse. It's not personal. It's about public, non-personal elements, when the trains run, what the infection rates are in our hospitals, how much the government's spending, where the bus stops are what the crime stats are, 
endless examples we're now seeing where if that data's opened up and the presumption is that government gives that data out, we can actually see real benefits, new kinds of economic empowerment, new kinds of businesses that use that data. We have great examples, and we're actually incubating many companies, new companies at the Open Data Institute to show those examples of where you can generate both social capital and economic value. It's really important in this world to not conflate my data, personal information, with these open data assets. Data comes in very different strains, and the constraints and issues that surround those different kinds of data have to be addressed separately. So we need an intelligent, grown-up dialogue, a debate about what the limits and opportunities are. But from everything I've seen, open data, the non-personal public data that companies often generate, that certainly governments have, once released, is a precursor to something that we're all trying to build and establish, open innovation. Open innovation thrives around open data, open licenses, open standards, and open minds. Thank you very much. Um, Christopher, who's the Information Commissioner um, uh, since 2009. It's uh, an appointment made by the Queen with independent status, and I'm sure many of you have seen Christopher in the various debates over the last few weeks and months about many of these subjects, including the Freedom of Information Act. Christopher. Well, Jamie, I'm, I'm really excited to be here, and many thanks to Telefonica and to the, uh, the campus event. Uh, for including the view of a boring old regulator. Because um, you can tell I'm a regulator because I'm the only guy wearing a tie. <laughs> um, and it's so exciting because here I am on the main stage at the O2 Arena. I have to tell you, my only other visit to the O2 Arena, arena was a big disappointment. I was invited by the BBC World Service. Where they were marking their 75th birthday, and they said, come to the O2 Arena, arena for a concert. And as I arrived at the tube station, the place was heaving with people coming to a concert by the Spice Girls. <laughs> and I thought, wow, the BBC has got really hip here. This is fantastic. But it turned out we were on a side stage with a lot of Mauritanian drumming. <laughs> Um, and so here I am, and it's, it, it's fantastic. That's such a good story. That won't count as part of your Thank three you. minutes. OK. <laughs> um, I think what I'm here to explain is that the Information Commissioner, and that's the UK's Data Protection Authority, um, and I'm also a vice chair of the Article 29 Working Party, which is the family of the other data protection authorities across the European Union. Um, data protection is not here to stop innovation happening. Data protection, I would suggest to you, is an enabler. It's not a barrier, because it's a key part of the confidence on which you can build all the exciting developments that your generation is going to pioneer. The Information Commission's office in the UK is not about saying stop. It's about helping you to do things safely within the rules so that we get this balance between openness and privacy that leads to the confidence that is necessary for innovation. That's why the ICO in the UK um, has published an anonymization code to help uh, entrepreneurs and innovators to deal with data, but in a way that doesn't trash everyone's privacy. That's why we're proud to be involved with Nigel's uh, Open Data Institute. And, in, and later on in the autumn, we're going to be publishing advice to app developers to help them to develop uh, products that don't trash everyone's privacy. So don't think that the boring man in the suit is just here to say, sorry, mate, you <laughs> can't do that, data protection. We're part of this exciting journey. Thank you. Chris, that's uh, very welcome words indeed. Um, now we're going to shift couches um, and Go straight to you, uh, Professor Alex Pentland, who I, I wasn't aware of this, but you are considered one of the world's top data scientists, which is an incredibly an incredible title. And, and of course, being at MIT, the mighty MIT, has, which has always had an extremely influential role in both computer science and the development of the internet. Your three minutes. OK. So um, some years ago, I became involved in mobile computing. I uh, run an entrepreneurship program. We spin off 
many companies, I spin off many companies, and I became concerned about privacy because the data that was coming from mobile, particularly, was so potentially invasive. And it wasn't that I was concerned about that data, but that there would be an overreaction that would squash all innovation. And as a consequence, I started a conversation at the World Economic Forum in Davos among the leaders of major companies like Telefonica, Microsoft, and so forth, and the leading regulators in the world, from the EU, the US, uh, around something that I called the New Deal on Data. So the New Deal on Data was an attempt to find a balance between the government's need to deliver public goods, to be able to make the population healthy, to green the planet, to provide good transportation, all of which can be done with big data. Uh, for companies need to remain financially viable. After all, they're the ones that facilitate creating this data. And citizens' rights, not just to privacy, but to get value from their data. Privacy is just one aspect of the value you can get from your data. And the discussions, which have now gone on for some five years, have been very fruitful, uh, have resulted in new regulation in the Europe and in the US, and interestingly, in places like China and India. And the tone of that is to give individuals control over data about them, so that you can say yes to things, you can have informed consent, no more EULAs, no more terms and conditions. Uh, and in that way, you can begin to shape the data future. At the same time, companies own the aggregate statistics that they calculate from their services. So they need to be, feel confident that they can use that data in a commercial way, and that companies, governments, and citizens can collaborate to deliver public goods, like stopping infectious disease and making transportation really work. And I think we've come a long way, but there's a lot more to happen. It needs to be a dialogue among these different groups to be able to figure out where the boundaries are between these and how best to use it. And that's why events like this are so valuable, because they help get all of the views and define what the boundaries are between what's useful, what's good, and what's not so good and should be discouraged. Luis, thank you very much, um, Alex. So turning to you now, Luis. Luis is a, a hacker and an entrepreneur and is uh, extremely good at both. He's founded a number of companies and recently won the first hack now. Congratulations on that. Yeah. You have three minutes. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm going to talk from my generation's perspective. Um, a couple months ago, I was finishing high school, um, and I was seeing the way my classmates uh, were using uh, mobile applications and web services, and the way uh, they were caring about their data. Um, what I figured out is that my generation uh, don't care a bit about privacy. Um, and that creates a lot of problems. For example, uh, classmates that upload a photo with, uh, you know, for example, his girlfriend uh, doing a thing that, I mean, uh, yeah, they didn't regret. And that's, that, that generates a lot of problems. I mean, privacy online between in, in among my, my generation, it's a, it's a really big problem. But I think we don't need restrictions or be, you know, uh, restrictions uh, like don't upload a photo, or, or if you're under 18 or you're um, underage, don't uh, join this website or this service. I think what we need is a better education regarding uh, uh, management of our online data. Uh, I mean, for example, uploading information or photos or whatever to Facebook is not mandatory. Uh, you do because uh, you like it and because you want to upload the data. Nobody is. Uh, like wanting you to upload that data. You do because uh, you want it. But the problem is that sometimes uh, we, the youngest, ignore the consequences of uploading that data. So you upload a photo and then re you regret. But it's too late because the photo, you know, when you upload something, uh, if you delete it, there, there is sort of people that have, for example, uh, retweet that tweet or download that, that photo. So it's, it's too late. Um, we decide if we trust a service if our friends use it. Um, and the early adopters, our friends that use that service, uh, usually don't care a bit about privacy. They uh, are the typical friends that um, post everything they do to Facebook. Uh, I mean, everything, like every 
five minutes they post a new update or it's like uh, they don't have a life, but yeah, you keep posting on Facebook. So that are the early adopters. They are the ones that don't, don't care about their privacy. Um, we really like to manage our, our info. Uh, the problem is that if, um, if the, the web service uh, makes our life easier, we just give away uh, our data to that service. So I think we really need education on privacy. And also, I would like to, to raise a point that um, was really mentioned when, when all this prism scandal some months ago. Um, when, when the media started to share with all of us that we could be spied uh, and started to share what the NCA was doing with prism, a lot of people said that they don't have anything to hide. And, and that's very interesting because uh, you don't have anything to hide until you have. I mean, for example, when creating a revolution or going against uh, the government, for example, or going against, uh, you know, doing a lot of political movements or, or, or just trying to get your freedom back. That was what, what happened, um, for example, in, in Middle East, what happened right now in Syria and other governments. So, so I think it's important to keep in mind that we, fa we have a lot of things to hide, and we still have things to hide. Thank you very much indeed. Excellent. And finally, Matthew. Matthew Candy is a, is a partner in the Global Business Services at IBM, and you've been responsible for IBM's digital front office across Europe. Three minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, so I've got a very simple perspective on this, which is consumer focus. And I think from a business perspective, that everything an organization should do, you know, if you put the consumer first and base it on what they want and need, then consumers are going to vote with their feet. Right? I think we're living in a world at the moment where, you know, if you look back, consumers have signed up for things, probably provided data without really thinking about it. I think consumers are becoming a lot more savvy about that now. And so we need new innovative approaches um, to, 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 to how consumers see things and how they provide you know, data to organizations. And then on the other side, you've got the business world where you know, organizations are moving into a world where they need to move to a richer dialogue with their customers, okay? So to drive competitive advantage, it's no longer about demographics, it's about how do I service that individual customer, consumer, citizen. And in order to do that, we need to build a massively rich picture of that individual. Um, you know, and then think very carefully about the strategies for how we instrument every interaction we have with that customer to use it as a method for gathering data. But more importantly, it's about what business does with that data to deliver more value back to the consumer and help go beyond kind of brand loyalty you know, and build an affinity that goes beyond just a transactional relationship. So I think there's four key changes that's got to happen for business to continue to uh, embrace and adapt to these changes. So first of these is around engaging the consumer, right? Don't try and guess what they want. Don't try and trick information out of them. But give the consumer the explicit power to opt in to how that business uses their data. Right, what they do with it, what analytics they run on it, but put the consumer in charge. Secondly, I think business needs to get better at showing how personal data can be used to provide better services for the consumer, you know, improve society and the world that we live in. Thirdly, this whole notion of value exchange needs to be at the heart of business's thinking. So you know, where is the value in that data for the consumer, but what can I give them in return for that data? And then finally, how do we start to shift the mindset at the top of organizations? So how do we tap into the millennial generation, the thinking that they have in order to start to shift and transform um, organizations around digital? And so I think there's, there's a few, well, four key opportunities out there. So the first one for business, I think, is around innovating and disrupt yourselves before somebody else does it to you. You, know, you need to find new ways of collecting data, but then new ways to innovate your business model around that. I mean, look at what Nike have done with Nike Plus and Fuel Band. Um, for the whole kind of running and sport industry. Amazon with Kindle, right? They disrupted their own market you know, in terms of selling books online before somebody else came and did it to them. So I'd pose the question, well, then you start to think about smart meters, right? And wh what are the utility operators going to do? How are they going to generate new products and services around that? Are they going to do that, or are they going to wait for somebody else to come and disrupt and innovate around them? Secondly, I think the big leap for many organizations is around the insight that they can get from data that sits outside of their organizations. Right? So how can they draw in all of that data from social and from the web and start to combine with the picture they have of their consumers within the organization, draw new insights, and start to deliver you know, richer, more personalized experiences back to citizens and back to consumers? Thirdly, for consumers, I think there's the opportunity for them to think about how they can start to sell 
and exchange that data for something that they deem of value. And then finally, I think, you know, where technology is going, how, how can business make more use of some of the innovative technology that's out there? And with IBM, this is something that we're very passionate about. And with our research division, you know, work that we've been doing around you know, deep solutions, algorithms for mining intelligence out of data, some of the Watson technology that we're now using within healthcare to try and um, come up with better diagnoses for cancer. Um, so I think you know, if you, you combine some of those factors, and for me, digital confidence is really all about how business needs to keep on finding innovative ways um, to meet and then exceed the demands and expectations of consumers. Thank you, and thank all of you for being so perfectly on time. Um, can I just start with you, uh, Ronan, and just ask you to elaborate slightly on what you think the business case here, what the business benefit is for someone like Telefonica to get involved in this. There are risks, of course, as well. So why did you make the decision to really try and work in this area? So um, at our heart, we're an experience-led business, not a technology-led business. We need to bring technology to life, and we need to be able to demonstrate the benefits for our business customers and our for, consume, for our consumers. To do that, we need to make sure that it, as our business moves from being an analog business to a data business, that those customers are engaged with their information in a way that they see real value. And at the moment, we can provide connectivity. I can upgrade a 4G network. I can spend a billion pounds doing it. But so what? What am I doing that's affording the opportunity for citizens to engage in a way that extracts real value out of that investment? That's where digital confidence has got to be at the heart of a sustainable economic and social model, not just in the UK, but in my view, wherever we operate. So I see it as purely smart business sense. Sandy, can I ask you to re respond? Because you, you've talked about, um, uh, and I, I, really, I really like the New Deal for data, and you've talked about the need for a dialogue, and that includes businesses. What are the sorts of things that someone like Ronan needs to be aware of that he practically should be doing to get involved into this, into this dialogue and to transform the business? Well, um you should ask. <laughs> so we're just having a conversation today with, for instance, My Data and Open Data Institute about how perhaps what we could do is set up a, a data, live data lab where we could experiment with new ways of sharing and engaging around data between businesses, between consumers, between governments in order to define where is the value, where are the dangers, what do people feel good about, to to establish a new sort of social contract uh, about what could be shared, what shouldn't be shared. For Ronan, what that means is there's now rules of the road for how he can engage people, what he can do, and there's an education for the population, for the businesses, about where the value is with engaging with, with his corporation. For the government, it's a new way to behave more effectively to engage with the, the citizens better. And for citizens, it opens up new possibilities that where they've voted with their feet to say, this seems to be good, it feels good, uh, we've looked around, nothing bad happened, uh, <laughs> some of the experts looked at it, doesn't seem dangerous, let's see if we can do this generally. The problem with social contracts, though, is that they're so difficult to know when you've got to one. I mean, in the, in the research that I've done looking at different population segments, nobody can agree on what's personal, what's public, uh, yeah, yeah. who should own it. How do we so, move? So the, 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 there's two things. One is, is that the general sketch of, a, of the contract is going along well, I think. The conversations at Davos, the new regulations. So you see these islands where there, there's fairly general agreement, not complete, but there's a lot of gray stuff in between. And there needs to be a conversation about what actually goes on in between. And that will take time, and I don't think it will ever get to a fixed point. I think what will happen is the gray areas will get smaller. They may shift over time. I mean, for instance, transparent government is good, but there's some go data government, when they give it out, um, can cause problems. There may be a boundary there, right? Same thing with with uh, companies, same thing with citizens. And it may be different for different people. It may be different in different cultures. Okay, feel free everybody else to jump in at any point, of course. But I want to go 
um, to you, Christopher. I mean, wh the events of recent months, Prism and Snowden's revelations, the stuff that we've seen about trolling on the internet and whether we should try to make steps to remove anonymity because people are getting bullied and they aren't always aware about what they're sharing. People are getting in the, in the parlance, getting doxxed. They're getting their, online, their offline identities revealed by very clever people who know how to navigate yeah. the online space. I mean, are we moving... I mean, do you think that the events of the last few weeks have changed the terms of this debate in any way? It's been quite an ex sort of roller coaster summer in that regard. It has been, and certainly the Snowden revelations about Prism and the activities of the uh, NSA and so on uh, are clearly having a major impact on the the politics around the proposed. Uh, European regulation on data protection, which has really got to be sorted out in the next few months. It's clearly had an impact on the German general election. Depending on that result, we'll see how the parliament in Brussels reacts, the council of ministers, the commission, and so on. So that, that's suddenly thrown everything up in the air. That's been, been quite telling. But um, I think that the, the fundamental debate about taking consumers and citizens with you as we explore the potential for um, open data um, hasn't really been changed so much by that or even the, the, the internet uh, uh, trolling uh, experience. Because there's a lot of good things happening. I mean, this week, um, the British, uh, the, the UK Freedom of Information Act has been amended to say that if you if you request information under the Freedom of Information Act, which ought to be made available to you, you have the right to say, and I want that in usable form. It can't just be provided for you as a, as a PDF or a photocopy. It's got to be something that you can actually do things with. That's, that's an achievement. Um, I'm having meetings tomorrow uh, in Manchester with the, the, the National Health Service authorities at their information center um, who are talking about uh, how we can uh, sell the idea of what's called care.data, which is the GP extraction service, which is taking the, the data about the efficacy of treatments, prescribing patterns, and so on, so that we can begin to use that information in a way that uh, will clearly d d deliver huge benefits to um, patients and citizens, because you haven't got to rely all the time on clinical trials. You can actually see which practices are prescribing what and how it's playing. All in anonymized form, of course. But it's terribly important that we put the investment in to make sure that citizen confidence is retained on something like that. Because if you're talking about health data, you're talking about the most sensitive personal information that exists. So if you, if you rush ahead, and brush aside people who are worried about this, concerned about this, then it, it, it stops the whole development in its tracks. And my, my worry is that the exciting innovators won't give enough thought to how you take the citizen with you. And I think that the government, for example, needs to work much harder at explaining what they're proposing, why, we're th why they're doing it, in order to convince. Because you can't just slip this under the counter and hope that people won't notice. They will notice, and when they've noticed, if they don't trust you, if they don't have confidence, you're not going to be able to do all the exciting stuff that big data offers. So confidence is absolutely key, and treating citizens and consumers as adults, leveling with them, explaining, as, as Ronan said, in relation to commercial services, you know, what's the value exchange? What's the deal? If you treat consumers and citizens as, gro as grown up, they will see the, what's in it for them, and they will want to cooperate. If you try to slip this sort of thing under the counter, it won't work. In fact, worse than that, it'll set back the, co the cause of every other big data development that you're trying to put forward. Nigel, how do we explain this to people? Because it, not everyone's as tech savvy sure. as, 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 well, many of us up here. And they will read horror stories about what Google may or may not have done and how much data Facebook has. And, oh, there's a story about GCHQ now. And it's sort of, it's bad for everybody. It's the curate egg effect. 
Yeah. How do you how do how do you just how do you explain this in a way that brings people along? Well, we, I mean, in, it, just in case we might seem to be in violent agreement on all of this, I think there is an awful lot to be said for the kind of experimentation, building through things like the My Data Innovation Lab, building examples that both corporates and advocacy groups, privacy advocacy groups, regulators can look at and consumers ultimately can see the benefits both ways. That's, that's just a really great thing to do. I also think we need really good examples from the world, and the world of open data is full of them, really good examples of data that might seem quite edgy that is used very powerfully for public good. So for example, uh, we had a great example at the Open Data Institute of a, of a company that took prescription data. Now this is data that every month the GP's prescriptions are made available as open data. Not to who, but what drug was made, uh, prescribed, and at what level. Now that's a superb data source. Over more or less two years now, we have millions and millions of prescriptions. We've run big data analysis over this, and we've identified for one class of drug, statins, one class of drug, a 200 million pound potential saving to the NHS because white label, you know, generic versions of that drug could have been made available rather than the licensed version. Now that insight is powerful. It's easy to explain. People see why it makes a difference. In the same way when the infection rates for hospital acquired infections were made available as open data, lots of people were saying this is going to be difficult for doctors, difficult hospitals, difficult for administrators. It held the system to account, and that builds confidence because everybody has to up their game. There's been an 85% reduction in hospital-acquired infections since that data was published. So we give them powerful stories that make the case for appropriate data disclosure. And also for innovators in this hall, the crucial thing is to get out and where you see an opportunity to derive value from a core data set that the government has or uh, you know is available to make the case for that data to be open. Because too often, the government talks a good talk, but when it comes to it, it'd rather sell the data to you. Data has most utility when it's widely used, not when it's sold. And that's true of the GPS signal. We understand the areas where this is massively true, and it's true in so many more places we could yet uh, 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 visit. Please, can I just ask you, uh, these are fantastic examples. Are they the sorts of examples that might help convince your generation, your friends and colleagues, that actually there's something really good in sharing a lot of my personal information? There's a public benefit as well to doing so. Yeah, I think, well, I think my generation has sharing built in. I mean, I think we were born uh, with, you know, with PCs, and uh, later with tablets and mobile devices. So, so we constantly share information. Um, what I think is that we don't have a consciousness of uh, public information, of sharing information for uh, the better of the public administration, for example, or, or to make better our country. So, so I think we need a lot of education uh, about how to manage our information and how our information uh, drives our country, for example, our, our government, or, or drives companies, for example. Because information is everything today. But we seem like we don't have the appropriate education to take decisions about what information we share, about if we should share more or less. So, your school, so are you saying that your schools don't really uh, give you the basic knowledge that you need to know what you're sharing, how you're sharing it, what you should be aware of? Yeah, the problem is that, at least in Spain, the teachers don't know a bit about your own social networks or that kind of uh, social sharing. So the problem is that they uh, cannot uh, tell you what to do. Well, the teachers never learned it, did they, at their teacher training school? So how, <laughs> how are we going to make sure? I mean, how, how can one expect that a teacher that may have been trained, Sandy, I put this to you, in a, in a training school tw 20 years ago is going to be able to describe to people accurately and truly the latest developments? Well, the way that we do it at MIT is you don't put education in charge uh, in, the, in the care of just faculty. We bring in entrepreneurs, we bring in public advocates, and they co-teach and in some cases run courses. And a lot of these things are hands-on. So an implementation of that would be in high school, you would have entrepreneurs, people like you, who would come back and run a class on how to build a social network app. Why not? People can do it. Yeah. 
And they would learn so much by having actually built things and seen how it works. It would become a very educational experience. In fact, in the courses that I teach, what I do is uh, I wait till people have been out for a year or two, they've started a company, they've done something, and then I bring them back. And they teach the class because their experience is more relevant than what I can do. I can help guide it and curate it, but it's the people that were in those seats the year before that are the most relevant. Hmm. Can I just build on, on that? Um, Matt mentioned uh, millennials, and one of the things we did some uh, research in Telefonica on millennials recently, and one of the things that was most telling for me that came out of all of that, and lots of information about technology and other things, but what came out of that was millennials believe that they want to do well and do good in parallel. Most of us thought we do well first, and then we do good after, and it was sequential. So actually, there's a real opportunity, and goes back to something Sandy said earlier, is if we're going to create an engagement with data, if we can get that public good out, well, actually, millennials naturally want to do well and do good at the same time. So maybe that's one of the axes that we have to be more focused on, to bring that public good out. And out of that, then consumers, as a second step, can say, OK, and how can I personally, in the do well part, out of it, because I now understand that it does good. Final reflection uh, from you, Matt. Um, business, do they have a responsibility to care about digital confidence? Is it schools, or what's your role? S sorry, what's my ro the role of a business in, in ensuring people know what they're doing? What, I mean, it's, it's mainly the responsibility of the education system, isn't it? Yeah, so I, th I think corporate absolutely has a responsibility. Um, so, you know, all, all businesses, no matter how big or how small, should be out there, should be working with the schools, the educational institutes, the universities, you know, helping them understand the work that all of us do um, in business and, and you know, what, what, what they should be doing in terms of educating the younger generations as they're coming through. Because I think the insights that we have, you know, and all of us here on this panel have different insights, different perspectives on this, we need to feed that in to help the educational institutes understand how to move forward and, sh and shift their thinking and shift the material and the point that you raised, you know, Lewis, in, in terms of helping explain to people what they should be doing with this stuff and what's right and what's wrong. Very briefly. Very briefly that the, uh, uh, in the UK, the Information Commissioner's Office, the, the Data Protection Authority for the UK, has a project on at the moment to develop with teachers materials that can be used as part of the national curriculum to teach information rights in schools and colleges. And it's not just about saying don't put silly things on Facebook or you won't get a job later on because your past cannot be deleted. It's about using the legislation we have, the Data Protection Act, the Freedom of Information Act, to access material in usable form to do stuff with. It isn't just a sort of an extension of um, social and personal education, keep safe online. It's much more than that. Um, and those materials are being piloted in schools at the moment. Can we see them anywhere? Uh, if you go to our website, www.ico.org.uk, you can read about our schools project. Wonderful. I'd like to open it up, actually, to the, to the audience now. It's, I can see a gentleman stood up vigorously at the back there. And if there's another, there's a, a gentleman here in the third, fourth or fifth row from the back on the left. Hello. Um, I'd like a question to the regulators, please. Um, about five years ago, the tax office lost the records of something like 20 million UK citizens. What happened in terms of punishment? Very. Can I hold? I'll give yeah. you a moment to think about that question. And we had a, another one down here. We, we now live and have lived for quite a while now in a very international world. Given that Google seems to regard UK privacy laws the same way I regard um, parking restrictions in France, um, <laughs> what, what is the role of data protection in a world where the, data, the people we're protecting against are in another country? And if we have regulations they feel are onerous, won't they just go somewhere where they can do what they want, like America? 
Yeah, okay, understood. Is there another one? I'll take one more here. Um, there's one there as well. Hello. Um, short question for me. If there is privacy, could you, maybe each one of you, give us an example of private information which is business relevant, which I cannot find about you on the internet? What, um, I'm sorry, would you like each of us to give you a piece of private information? No, 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 no. <laughs> Just the name of it. You can tell me, for example, you cannot find when I was born. That's an example. But give me a piece of relevant information for business, for advertising, which I cannot find about you on the internet. If there is privacy, give me an example of something that I wouldn't know. Don't tell me the value, tell me the attribute name. Okay, I want all of you to think about it. That's a pretty strange question. I, I imagine there are quite a few. You've got an answer already, do you? Wait, wait one moment, wait one moment. I'm going to take... So funny, eh? <laughs> so if you have a mobile phone, I can tell you where your girlfriend lives. But Not your wife, your girlfriend. He wants right? to know something that he wants. <laughs> he wants to know something that you can't find, not something that oh, you no, can it's find. It's not on the internet, but you can get it off of other sorts of data that are private currently. Uh, hold on, sorry, we can't hear. We'll take the other. We'll take the other question and maybe come back to you. Um, hi, thank you for all coming and giving such insightful talks. Um, this question is specifically for. Professor Nigel Shadbolt. Um, I'm myself from the University of Southampton, um, specialising um, in artificial intelligence as an undergraduate student. And I was, in a sense of um, digital confidence and open data, you said open data is open mind. But I think it's more so about not just seeing value um, in, and then giving us giving your permission to use the data, but in a sense, having security of that data, because in a sense that um, there's a sense of uncertainty that what we give your, the, the data that we give you will be, not be manipulated. And I think that is probably the most fundamental thing why there is this sort of reluctance of giving, um, digital, um, giving digital information over. And I just thought, especially from an AI standpoint, the more data you have, the, more, the, the, the better program that you can make. I just thought what your thoughts on that were. Okay, can I, can I start with, with you, Christopher? Yeah. There, there were sort of two questions directed to you, and I suppose the, what happened to the tax office yeah. disks, but actually the general ability of governments to securely look after data, I think, is what that question is, is, really, is really driving at. Yeah. And the international laws, that is a bit of a problem, isn't it? Okay, well, what did happen to the, the, the child benefit tax disk? Because nobody knows. Somebody put them in the post. Stupid. They weren't in, encrypted. Uh, this is 2008, and there was very little that the Information Commissioner could do about it at the time, given the legislation available. But it changed everything. That was the big wake-up call to government of uh, what could go wrong. Um, as a result of that lo loss, my organization was given the power to impose civil monetary penalties for the most egregious breaches of data protection principles. We've issued 42 of them so far over the past couple of years. Uh, we can fine up to half a million pounds. Um, and it certainly improved the game of Whitehall. Local government is, has some way to go, and the health service too. But at least we've got the, the, the stick uh, to, 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 to name and shame. Um, so far as Google is concerned, I don't think a half a million pounds fine on Google is going to t make them sit up and take notice. But we can, um, and we, we do, in fact, Google were with us uh, the week before last, um, discussing their, their new uh, privacy policy. By working with other data protection authorities in other jurisdictions, um, we're, we're sharing out the load. In the case of, I mean, someone said something disobliging about the French. The, the French uh, data protection authority, the CNIL, is leading the work on, on Google at the moment. And we try not to just investigate the same thing again and again in different jurisdictions. But international enforcement is the next thing that we're working on. There's a big international conference in Warsaw at the end of September. And I've got a, a motion uh, being debated there about effective international enforcement coordination. And it's not just the European Data Protection Authorities, it's working with the Federal Trade Commission. Peter Fleischer from Google said, what keeps me awake at night is European regulation and American enforcement. So there's quite a lot we can do if we work together. <laughs> so we're inching towards some kind of settlement. Things are getting better in the 
dialogues that you're having around the world, including at Davos. So we are moving in a good direction, it seems. Um, Nigel, you had a specific question, maybe from one of your yeah. angry students. Well, 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 <laughs> well, <laughs> but, but, yeah. but also, could you, could you maybe tackle this gentleman's question about what can you not find nowadays? Yes. Because yes. people are very worried yes. about the so-called de-anonymization yes. yes. uh, of data where you can do incredibly interesting things and, that, and actually identify people with pseudo-anonymous yeah, data. Yeah, yeah. It, it, the challenge was to give you a piece of information that you can't find. How I voted at the last election. Okay? I mean, and you might be able to make all sorts of inferences, but you can't know what I put in that box. Okay? So, but we can uh, predict it on Facebook. Uh, well, you think you can. You don't know. Okay? Probabilistically. So, well, actually, you don't <laughs> know. <laughs> uh, and, you know, you, you, of course, and it relates back to the issue about uncertainty reduction, which is the other question, which is how... How can you be confident in the information you have? So we are living, of course, in a world where the analytics, the micro-segmentation, the analysis that happens is this powerful lens, and it seems to triangulate more and more around exactly what our propensities are, as Sandy said, you know, who your paramours may be, all sorts of information. But there will always be a place where, if we determine, we can either put legislation in place to protect us, we can put social norms and conventions, or we simply can take a view that we will, that we will kind of uh, accept the trade-off of utility and this information will become available. What you're asking for in each of these cases is, is the provenance of the information. And I think it's an important issue around all these data sets is, do we know where they originated? Do we have enough information about the information, enough metadata, enough information about the information to tell us, are we assured of its quality? Or this data set, what do we know about that? Uh, one of the um, projects that's uh, particularly popular at the moment at the Open Data Institute is the issuing of open data certificates. And these are, are essentially evaluations of the quality and nature of the data that's being made available. It's OK putting data out there, but if it's a variable quality or poor quality or poorly sampled, you would like to know. And you don't want to build a business on poor data. Good point. I would like each of you now to wrap up. We are just about out of time, but I want to give you each of you 30 seconds just to quickly say, where next? What do we do next? What do you think we should... Where should this go next? What's the sort of practical or philosophical move that we need to make. Can I start this end with you, Matt, and we'll actually go reverse, back down, and finish up with okay. Ronan. So I'm going to drop in three points. Oh, they're 10 seconds each. Yep, OK. <laughs> so first point about new partnerships and collaboration. Right? I think you know, when you look at organization, the ability for new partnerships outside of your organization with others around data to exploit new value, first thing. Second thing, we need to think about the impact this has on business and organizations around the skills within that business. So take a marketing department, right? What they do now is vastly different to what they've done um, uh, you know, over time. So it's no longer about TV ads and print, but immersive and interactive experiences yeah. and the data behind it. And then the third point is in order to innovate, you, know, you need to break things off from the organization. So I think we have Telefonica and Telefonica Digital and what you've done with that great example. Right, in order to really innovate and drive that, break it off from the main organization and allow them to do things in a different way. Brilliant. Luis, 30 seconds. Yeah. So uh, I think the future respecting to uh, how to manage data uh, in software, there is, I think, the most used uh, form of managing data, for example, social networks. I think the next step is peer-to-peer. Uh, -peer. So far, there is peer-to-peer, -peer, so you have your information, you own it, but you can plug your information in the social network so you are connected. Thank you. Andy. I think the most important thing to do is to do uh, test experiments, essentially to try new regulatory environments, new ways of sharing data out in the real world. Because policy discussions go nowhere. Mm. They're about you know, things that probably won't happen, and we can't anticipate the consequences. So you have to actually take a city, say, in this city, we're going to do things differently. We're going to live in the future. And we're going to see how this new policy works. I can see the hacker's ethics still the live hacker's strongly is there. in MIT, which is good to see. And to use it to, do it to create legislation and regulation, that's an interesting one. Chris, 30 seconds. Um, let's not get too starry-eyed about everything that's labeled big data. Uh, can't predict everything. There's a story uh, in the news today that you can tell how someone votes from the way they dress. <laughs> now, according to that study, uh, this panel is entirely of the left, except for me. 
I don't know whether that's true. <laughs> <laughs> it, could, it could well be true. But <laughs> uh, well, plus one to the last two points. I, um, I, think, uh, I think what we're going to see is a shift. It's a shift that is happening partly by, the, by, the, by dint of the technology. Our ability to collect data on our own cells, on our own behalf, of our habits, store it, analyze it, will increasingly distribute back to the individual. So I think companies, innovators, have to get with the game there, understand it, and at the same time, keep the pressure, keep the foot on the neck of government to give power back to citizens. If they want citizens informed and engaged, give the data back. So I think two things. We have to build proper collaboration between public and private to start to bring the good, the public good, uh, to the forefront. And I think, to Nigel's point, I think we have to engage people's curiosity. If we engage people's curiosity, we will engage them in the data revolution. The opportunity for people to know how they stand relative to others is something that everybody's curious about. And that's a great way for people to use their information under their control against a data set that is everybody else. That way, people will start to get engaged and we'll bring customers on the journey. Thank you. So I think that really we're, we're going in a good direction. We've still got a long way to go. Collaborating as far as possible where we can. Keeping an eye on government where we can. Um, experimenting where we can. And making sure that people are more aware of what they're giving away and what they can get in response uh, uh, as a result of that is an extremely strong message, I think, for all of us to take away. So it leaves me with nothing more but to, of course, thank Campus Party and Telefonica for putting this on, thank all of the speakers that have, uh, have contributed, thank all of you for taking part, and, uh, and I'd like to thank everyone up here with a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Good.